So um, I'm assuming that you saw the uh, the keynote upstairs uh, and uh, you know kind of have got that that information uh, um, processed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the base chart uh, that was in that uh, that presentation and then go a little bit deeper. Um, the surveys that I'm going to be using today, there are two primary sources. The first is uh, Forrester's uh, Developer Foresight Survey, which we do on a yearly basis. Uh, this year's was across 11 different countries, uh, and we were surveying only folks that said that they have actually written code uh, in the past 12 months, so people that tend to be very hands-on. Uh, the second survey that I'm going to be drawing from is uh, uh, the Future of Open Source Survey, which is done by uh, Northbridge and a consortium of other companies, uh, something that I kind of uh, help with uh, in, in setting the survey instrument on a yearly basis. And uh, then uh, uh, it's something that uh, uh, was released in April of this year, so again, 2014 data. And it is a mix of software professionals, folks that are on the uh, sell side of the industry as well as on the buy side of the industry and a range of folks, developers, product managers, even uh, executives across a range of different companies. So those are the two sources today. Yep. Should we hold questions for the end? Or? You know what, I'm happy to take questions throughout. So go ahead and fire them up there. Uh, we can make this as interactive as, as possible because there's not a lot of folks in here. Uh, so first slide, uh, you know, just reiterating what I said in the keynote, uh, when we asked developers the question, which of the following classes of open source software tools or frameworks have you used for development or deployment in the past 12 months? Um, a wide variety of responses. The way that I would read this is 41% of developers say that they have used an open source RDBMS in software that they have developed or deployed in the past 12 months. Not that open source RDBMSs are 41% of the market. So it's important to understand what that means. Uh, so, so it's not necessarily market share, uh, but it is the level of common usage across uh, different developers. And we asked that, the question at the bottom as part of that. So they can select as many different things as they want on this question, or they can select have not used o uh, open source. That's an exclusive option. So again, um, if I had to characterize the survey data set, there's a lot of um, Microsoft developers uh, in this survey or folks that are using Microsoft tools. Uh, you'll see that in some of the later slides when we look at specific tool options. Uh, so if you were to say, well, 40 to 50% of the survey on average is folks that are using Microsoft technologies, given that survey sample, we're still at a one in five ratio. That's pretty, pretty impressive. So basically all the folks that are not in the Microsoft uh, te uh, technology community tend to use open source, and a fair amount of people even that are in the Microsoft space, the .NET space, uh, are using open source uh, as well. Yep. How were, uh uh, it was a widely cast survey that we had a number of different opt-in questions for. And the primary opt-in question was, have you written code in the past 12 months? And then as a secondary, we asked them about their, their developer status. Uh, so, so what describes the code that you've written? Uh, you've, done, you've been a professional developer. You work at a company that builds software for a living. Uh, you work at a company, you develop software, but the, the company that you professionally, but the company that you work at, uh, you know, doesn't sell software, so that would code into the IT bracket. And we bucketed uh, those lists. So it's not completely just representative of whoever opted into the survey. Uh, it's about 20% professional software developers, about 40% IT developers, about 20% developers at uh, systems integrators, 10% uh, students, and about 10% non-professional developers and about a 5% sample of uh, folks that work at gaming companies. So a couple different buckets of developers. But the initial pre-qualification was survey was public media advertising? Uh, no, it was, uh, we used a survey provider to, out, we, we outsourced to a survey provider to gather the uh, survey instrument. So. Do you directly email people on a mailing list? Uh, no, they, they have an existing, uh, they have an existing body of folks that opt in to surveys and so they send out emails that basically say we think you might be a fit for this survey and then they go and people go in and respond and take those surveys. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just unclear, so just taking like the 41% for databases, um, that doesn't mean that, you know, 59% use something else, it just means that... 41% you know, said that they used right. an open source database in their they systems. They might not have even used a database at all. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So important to understand that. Now let's look at some of the different developer types and we can see some variants. I picked uh, three of the segments of, of, the, uh, 
of the survey in particular so we could see the variance. And what you see here is when you look at IT developers, you tend to see on average a little bit lower adoption, but you know, within the, 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 uh, the margin of error for most things, uh, with the exception of the have not used open source. So uh, that's 24% versus 20% overall. And when you compare that to pro developers, so these are people that say, I work at a company that builds and sells software for its business. Those numbers are, are, are lower, they're at 16%. Uh, when you look at students, I'm sorry, misspelling there in my, when I put the graphs together. Um, students would be folks that say that they are currently, uh, um, you know, being educated. Uh, they write code, but uh, they are not uh, uh, full full time employed. They're they're in an educational institution, uh, and that's eight percent. So when we look at younger devs that are in training, uh, higher usage across the board of open source software across the various different levels, and you'd expect that. Uh, but it is a pretty clear uh, um, uh, shift uh, from, uh, from the overall responses. Now let's take a look at country. As I mentioned, we, uh, we did it across 11 different countries. I pulled five here just so you can see some differences in, in, in geographic variance. Um, when we look at some of the most popular uh, uh, elements from the survey, uh, you'll see in general uh, much higher response rates for open source usage uh, in India and China overall. And look at the have not used uh, OSS for India and China. It's at less than 1% in the survey sample. Uh, compared to uh, the US, which is at 33%, or France and Germany, which is at 16%. And you know, again, not totally surprising. I was, I was perhaps a little bit surprised that the numbers in India and China were as high as they are. I would have certainly expected them to be higher. Um, I was also a bit surprised that the number in the U.S. was, was demonstrably higher uh, and, and out of the margin of error between uh, France and Germany, although we've traditionally seen higher rates of open source adoption in Europe. Um, UK has been a little bit of a laggard. Um, that was a gap that I would have expected to close over time and it doesn't seem to be closing as fast as I would have expected since we started gathering this sort of data. So uh, for whatever reason, there still seems to be a, a body of, uh, of developers uh, here in the U.S. that uh, are either using open source and don't know that they're using it or are not using open source at all consciously. How long have you been tracking this? Uh, we've been asking this sort of question for about five or six years since I took over coverage in 2008 at Forrester. Um, we've seen the overall n reporting numbers uh, kind of uh, stabilize at between 75 and 85 percent in terms of outright usage. They fluctuate a little bit year over year. Um, we've seen uh, um, the, the overall aggregate country numbers in India and China just go off the charts uh, in that, that, that five year period. Um, some other things that I would say, uh, I mentioned earlier today in the keynote, we've seen app server usage actually trend down a little bit. I don't think that's because there, people aren't using open source app servers relative to commercial app servers uh, less. Uh, I think it's because they're using app servers less and they're building different types of things like mobile applications or web applications where they may not be using uh, app servers as much today as they were when we first started collecting this data in 2008. Um, Switching to a question about how important different factors are uh, to increasing adoption and use of open source. Uh, this is a question that the Future of Open Source surveys ask for a number of different years, and we've seen uh, uh, various responses. Uh, uh, the survey respondents can choose either it's important, it's neutral, or it's unimportant. Uh, most folks say that everything is important to them, as, as you might expect. Uh, so. The, the interesting thing about this particular data point from my perspective is what's, what most people say is important versus what the least people say are important. Um, when I first started taking inquiries from our clients in 2008 uh, around open source, um, it was right at the start of the, uh, the Great Recession, and I was getting a ton of calls around open source, and almost all of them were cost-driven. Essentially, can we use open source to reduce our capital expenditure costs? I still get some of those today, but I would say as opposed to early adopter uh, type, type companies, that's mainly late mainstream or laggard 
uh, that I get those sort of cost calls. And you see that, that on the survey, the thing that's absolutely at the bottom uh, in terms of uh, increased adoption is the fact that the acquisition and maintenance cost is, 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 is low. Um, still important, but, but, but not relative to the other things. What's at the top is uh, better quality software. That's a change in, in, what, in the perception of open source because traditionally uh, the way that we saw people think about open source was, well, it costs less, it's easier to uh, uh, adopt, and maybe I give up some, some quality. I don't get the Cadillac. Uh, but I can get a Honda instead, and uh, I have to be willing to live with that. The reason why I think that issue, better quality software being the top driver for open source in this year's survey is important, is because of the way that we tend to see open source uh, take over a particular market segment. Uh, I, I, I think of it in terms of, of Hondas versus Cadillacs. If you look at a particular market segment, like uh, development tools as an example, you've got products that are very low cost and you've got products which are extremely high cost. And typically big enterprises buy the high cost products because they think if they cost more, they must be getting more, they must be more valuable. Uh, it's the same reason that people buy Cadillacs because they've got a bigger engine, because uh, they've got this perception of being the top in the market uh, and, uh, and, and it's the best that you can get. Um, the reality is not everybody in the world needs a Cadillac. If all you're interested in doing is getting from you know, Raleigh to Durham, you know, a Honda is going to do you just as well. Now, the reason that, that open source and, and quality becoming an issue is important is because people buy Hondas because they tend to be less expensive than Cadillacs, but they also tend to buy them because over time it's possible for them to be higher quality than Cadillacs. If you think about Cadillac in the early 80s, early 90s, well, you know, maybe the, the hood uh, wasn't quite aligned right or there was a lot more maintenance and you had to take it into the shop or it had a little puddle of oil underneath it in the driveway. Um, and people started to buy Hondas because they didn't have to take them in to get fixed as often. So it wasn't just that they were cheaper, it was also that they were higher quality. And when you get to that point where you're now buying products not just for the price but also for the quality and the quality plus the features is uh, ahead of where that Cadillac product is, that's when you start to see major substitution uh, happen in a market. So let's use something like uh, the app server market as an example. You've got web here and web logic. I might call those the Cadillac products in the Java application server space. Um, and you have something like you know, Tomcat, which doesn't have as many features. It didn't have every bell and whistle with respect to enterprise Java beans, but it did servlets really well. Uh, so I could use it. It was a lot cheaper. It, had, it got me from point A to point B if all I was doing was writing servlets, and I would start using it. As you get to the point where Tomcat is perceived as a higher quality offering as well as having the features I need to get me from point A to point B, well, why would I go by WebSphere at 30K a pop per server node anymore? And I think that's one of the reasons we see certain niches of enterprise products running into some stiff headwinds because essentially the way that you respond if you're a Cadillac provider is a couple different things. You either put more features in to appeal to your top of market clients, so you add the power windows, you add the satellite radio, and you put a bunch of things in there to justify your increasing price points, you maintain and start to cut your development expenses, which prevent you from innovating and adding new features, or you just try to cash cow the product and get as much money as you possibly can out of it by making it as cheap as possible uh, to maintain. And then quality starts to suffer over the long term when you do that. So whatever response that you take, you eventually get into the, to, to the point where you see a substitution zone. And in product category after product category, we are starting to see open source um, displace commercial products because those commercial products have hit that substitution zone of uh, quality plus features. Yeah. Red Hat Enterprise Linux is open source. Red yep. Hat Enterprise Linux is also a commercial product. Mm -hmm. Dichotomy is open source versus proprietary. And 
then within that you might be commercial or not. Right. So like the Tomcat, Tomcat wasn't cheaper. Right. It wasn't much cheaper than Webster. At this point, it was cheaper than Webster. Yes. Tomcat, if you download from ApacheTV.org, right. strictly speaking, is zero. Yep. However, there are commercial vendors like Springforce. TC server. On top of Tomcat yep. Backup. So right. the question, I guess, is does your data take into account the you know, difference between the pure open source you just download for free and the commercially supported stuff, the TC server? It's not that subtle because in a survey you basically have to ask the questions and the issue that you get is you get people, you get respondents interpretations of those questions as well. So uh, in this case, you know, the, the survey, you know, the, the, the respondent sees that question so it's just how they and it's however they take it and however they respond to it. Do you foresee Forrester at any point trying to do any research into that particular distinction and understand anything about when people are paying for open source and when they're not? Um, I have done, I do uh, anecdotal research into that. And in general, you know, the, 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 the rule of thumb that I would give people is developers don't pay, their managers do. Um, essentially, they buy insurance policies. And whether it's commercial software or it's open source software, uh, that's been true as long as I've been in the industry. Um, when I started as a Power Builder developer, you know, the reason that we bought Power Builder instead of VB back in that day was because we could get other database connectors. Now, were we ever going to switch from Oracle to DB2 at the company that I was at? Probably not. But that insurance policy created that extra value, that we had flexibility. And I see much the same buying patterns go on. So management tends to buy when they go into production. Uh, they tend to buy so that they can have a throat to choke. They tend to buy management features and consoles and things that help you scale. Uh, and the developers don't. So. Well, we have surveys that are not targeted at developers. The ones that, that we tend to ask the most open source questions are. So, Okay, um, so why are companies selecting open source uh, software? Again, this is from the uh, Future of Open Source survey. Um, as you would expect, uh, technical uh, capabilities and features is, is number one in terms of importance. And that mirrors what I tell folks. I said, you know, look, uh, when you evaluate open, it's funny because folks will come to me with an inquiry and they'll say, well, you know, how should we think about open source? Well, you can't think about it in that monolithic way. You should be stacking the open source projects up uh, and having them go toe to toe with the commercial products in their space and then adding some extra things when you think about open source, which is, is there a foundation or a company that is supporting it? Uh, if uh, it's, it's not either of those things, uh, how many committers are there? How frequently are the committers committing? Uh, how stable is the commit base? So it is essentially extra things that you want to look at when you evaluate. But other than that, competitive features and technical capabilities, security, ease of deployment, uh, TCO concerns, these are the same things I would use to evaluate a commercial product as well. Now, a couple things on, on this. Um, when you think about technical capabilities and you think about cost, um, those are two of the fundamental uh, uh, legs of what I would call the iron triangle in software development, uh, which I've referred to here as uh, you've got cost, you've got capability, and you've got schedule. Traditionally, what we say is pick two of those, and then you have to hold the other one constant. Now, the interesting thing about open source is it does have the potential to be one of those transformational uh, technologies which can expand all three vertices of the Iron Triangle. So specifically in the cost perspective, you do potentially see a reduction in capital expenditures if you're not spending on the software up front. From an operational expense, what we have talked to folks that have used open source at scale uh, um, you know, the operational expenses can vary. If you're buying support, the cost of support for an open source product may not be that much less than the cost of support for a commercial product. And a lot of vendors price their support uh, to reflect what the commercial vendors get in that market. From a labor expense perspective, what we have seen is often your labor costs might increase a little bit. Now the reason for that is that often you have to you know, hire a little bit more experienced developers or sysadmins because sometimes documentation is not the best as it could be. Stuff's evolving very fast. Uh, the, uh, the supply might be a little bit less. 
Uh, so, you know, you could see uh, your labor expenses go up by a couple percentage points depending on how broadly uh, you are going to adopt. Uh, so, but, but in general, the decreasing capital expenses and the flexibility with regard to operational expenses tends to more than make up uh, any increase in the, in the labor cost, especially if you're a large company and you're looking at your highest cost uh, capital uh, software items, which is why we've seen things like app servers and operating systems uh, tend to be some of the first targets of competitive takeouts. Uh, from a capability standpoint, uh, features, uh, again, we get to the features you need uh, versus the features that the products have, and, and back to that Honda uh, Cadillac uh, uh, test, and also the, uh, uh, the, the quality test as well. Now, there's a little bit of an evolution in this capability space. As I talked about in my, my keynote earlier today, in some of the new areas of technology, in the mobile space, in the NoSQL space, in the analytics space, uh, we actually see capability for open source projects leading commercial products initially because they're some of the first products uh, that are being developed in that space and the commercial vendors are playing catch up, often by building commercial offerings on top of the open source projects now as opposed to trying to compete with them. Um, the schedule one is, is interesting. The place where we tend to see schedule accelerate, accelerated significantly with open source is actually during the acquisition period. If you work at a large company, you know what it's like working with the procurement department. Uh, it can take weeks, if not months, to make a significant investment in any sort of new software uh, product. And so I often run into devs that basically say, hey, we're going to try all the open source alternatives first because it is so painful dealing with our procurement department that we're only going to go commercial if we prove that the open source stuff can't work. Um, the development cycle and the velocity piece is a little bit more interesting, uh, and we're starting to see some evolution there as well. Anybody here heard of Docker? I would hope so, right? Um, we're seeing a tremendous amount of use of Docker at some of our clients as much to drive development velocity as to drive uh, uh, manageability uh, of, 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 uh, of, of applications. And so the ability to fix code without having to go back to a vendor is a velocity argument. The uh, ability to deploy code more rapidly uh, on a modern architecture goes to the velocity argument as well. So potentially expansion of all three elements of the Iron Triangle, it's rare that you see technologies that can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, typically, you know, the issue is, well, you know, how do we deal with open source licenses and viral licensing? Is open source even safe? You have to understand lawyers are essentially uh, rewarded to say no, okay? Because they're about reducing risk. And the easiest way to reduce risk is to say no to everything, okay? Um, and, and, and so, you know, to the extent that open source still has questions or concerns, there is still this issue where the general counsel of a company will, will will have issues. Now, are those issues realistic? Are they practical? Uh, we've seen almost no indication uh, since the, the SCO lawsuit went down in flames that there are specific tangible threats that uh, uh, organizations, IT shops, need to worry about. But still, uh, we find that getting the general counsel of an organization out there and letting them work with um, folks that are sophisticated with, with open source uh, legal issues is uh, is a challenge. I'm constantly referring folks to, P, uh, to to people like DLO Piper and those sorts of things, so that their legal folks can essentially okay what the technical folks want to do. Yeah. 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 Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it tends to be an over the hump type of thing, and often the way that you can have it uh, have uh, work through that is you start with some of the most uh, benign licenses, like you say MIT or, or, uh, or Berkeley or, or you know, Apache, and then say, you know, for now, we're going to say anybody that wants to use a GPL license, we're going to have a special review for that. And, and we'll go from there. And that's one of the ways that we see folks working through that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, that's an observation.
right? Wondering how the data would be skewed if you ask those questions to companies who provide the solution. Right. Now, this survey is a mix of both. Uh, if you look at the uh, Future of Open Source survey, uh, the, the, that, that particular source, uh, that is about half and half. And half that. it's about half providers and half users. So it's, it's different than the, than the Forrester Dev uh, survey. <coughs> okay. Uh, so where is open source uh, headed next? Uh, in the open source survey, we asked uh, uh, the, the professional, software professionals here, um, where they thought open source was going to have the most impact. Um, everybody seems to be interested in the, uh, in the growth of technology-focused mm -hmm. communities. Uh, again, I would expect that. Open source has always been very technology-focused. Uh, but you'll see innovation here is the number two thing that folks uh, uh, said would be an important uh, trend. Uh, and then the adoption of open source into non-technical business uh, segments. Um, in general, folks don't seem to have a very good uh, um, feeling for industry-focused communities. Now, I'm not sure about that. I see lots of, of open source that is industry-specific in the education space in particular, and uh, I think there, there is some work uh, going on in the, automotive, uh, in the automotive space. I actually see quite a bit in the financial services space uh, with some of the banks, uh, the large banks that are getting together to, uh, to work on on technologies. The other you know, thing that, that you know, I think it may be a little bit of a red herring is I'm getting a lot of questions on this one from our enterprise IT clients, which is uh, can we start to use uh, open source methods internally in our own organization? I hear it called inner sourcing a lot. We want to do inner source. And so uh, that, that's really just started to happen in the last year or two. Now, I know that there are companies that have been doing it for years and years, uh, but the fact that our clients are starting to, uh, to specifically use that term now is indicative to, uh, to me that that might be a little bit more important uh, than what the uh, software professionals out there think. Yep. Um, forgive me, I don't mean to be harsh, but yep. um, looking at a 13-point range from the top to the bottom, do you have any reason to believe that anything on this slide is more valuable information than flipping a coin to get down this thing? Um, well, you know, I would say that, that when you get 13-point ranges across 1,400, the uh, level, uh, the margin of error is about three points. So, yes, um, you know, what I, you know, I would, I would say I would use it as directional. Sure, but even, even the fundamental question, like you're asking non-experts, what do you think of the future? Yep. It's a fair point. Yeah. It's a fair point. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All of these were uh, multi. Uh, that was a multi-select question. Up. Oh, another question. So, as an example. Internal communities where you're sharing software projects internally. Uh, I wrote a case study uh, a couple years ago about Sabre and some of the things that Sabre has, has done inside their company. And they started with external um, adoption of a lot of different open source projects, Crossfire <laughs> as an example. And what they found over time was that they wanted to then start taking, they wanted to start taking the projects they were developing, the utilities that they were using internally, and making that stuff available across multiple projects. And so what ended up happening was uh, they started using community practices that are used in the open source community internally. And as a result, one of the things that they saw was a flattening of their, their, um, their management structure. Okay. So, so more, more project repository, Yep, yep, API yep. Small yeah, yeah. Some other things that we're starting to see, uh, we're starting to see things like, uh, you know, 20% time being used internally a little bit more often, uh, internal hackathons, uh, those sorts of, of, of things as extensions to that. Consider yourself lucky. <laughs> Yeah. 
Imagine a world where you've got all the developers in one silo, you've got all the testers in another silo, you've got sysadmins over here and everything gets thrown over the wall and you don't use anything that any other team has developed. Everything gets written on your project. Uh, you, know, every, you know, whenever you have a problem with a commercial software product, you've got to go back to that vendor and wait for them to deliver a fix for you, sometimes days, sometimes never. Yes. <laughs> yes, there are. You know, never, never underestimate the power of inertia. Okay. So. Okay. So, uh, so since some of you don't like the uh, future of open source survey, uh, well, no, actually, this next one is from that as well. Uh, we'll get back to the the, the, for, uh, the developer, the Foresight's one in a little bit. Um, this is actually uh, a, uh, another multi-select question, but we asked uh, uh, the same uh, folks, where do they perceive the different areas are that open source is leading? Uh, so cloud and virtualization, number one. Um, now again, this is folks not necessarily saying, uh, when I look at things like gaming and drones and ERP, I think there's a little bit of different stuff going on. You don't necessarily see a ton of, of open source as the dominant frameworks in the gaming space. For drones and 3D printing, I think it's probably a little bit early for those markets. I thought it was an interesting question. ERP, that is another area where we still see commercial products tend to, uh, uh, to dominate. Uh, but uh, the mobile space and the content, uh, well, the mobile space, uh, I'll give you another data point on in a second that, lets me believe, uh, that, that I, makes me believe that, that that is actually happening in terms of developers reporting what they are using. Um, so let's shift back to the uh, Forrester uh, data. So again, just as a reminder, these are developers uh, as opposed to software professionals uh, across the range of industries. When we asked them, well, what operating system do you use on your primary development machine, you'll see you know, there's still an awful lot of devs out there that are using Windows on their development machine, 48% plus 14% plus 7%. Uh, that's what, that's 69%. So two out of three devs are still running Windows machines. You know, well, you know, there's a lot of devs out there that are still in that world. Uh, we've got another uh, 10, 11% uh, that are using Mac, and that's gone up from about 8% over the past few years. So uh, there's a few more folks that are buying these, these lovely MacBook Pros. Uh, when we add up the ones that say that they're using a variant of, of Linux, it is uh, right at about 12%. So about one out of eight devs uh, in our survey is, is actually uh, developing on Linux. And these are not particularly open source developers? Nope. All these are all developers. So when you look at the market as a whole. Um, if we look at the SCM space and we look at uh, the products in green are the ones that, that you know, are, are open source projects uh, or open source licenses, uh, First of all, this, this blows me away. I still can't believe that even today there's that much visual source safe out there. Uh, again, never, never, never underestimate the power of inertia, okay? <laughs> um, but uh, you've got Subversion, uh, number two, um, and then you've got Git and uh, CVS. Uh, we could debate whether or not GitHub should be green here or not. Uh, you know, I've left it blue for the, for, for the time being. Um, but uh, depending on how you would interpret that, you, you would see get it either 12% uh, 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 overall or 10%. Or now, um, this backs up what I see in practice. When I talk to enterprise IT shops, there is a ton of subversion that is still in use. When I talk to folks in the open source world, uh, when I talk to folks that are in the cloud world, that are in the mobile world, uh, when I talk to younger developers, that's where I tend to see all the get. Uh, so I do think that there is some substitution going on, uh, but there is a bit of nervousness uh, specifically around DVCS in this space and the idea that if I don't have the master repository in my data center, I don't control my code. So you haven't yeah. yeah, you know, uh, again, remember there's some freelancers in here and you could make the argument that if I'm writing code on my own, what do I need to do D, uh, uh, SCM for? I would say that's a stupid argument, but you know, hey, developers are perfect, right? We never make mistakes, right? Uh, um, per four, uh, per four is on the list, 2%. Oh, really? 
Yeah, we see it very strongly in the gaming market, uh, or people building games as an example, but yeah, it's, it's around. And this was a single select, you could only select one. Um, so, uh, you know, Mercurial's kind of hanging out here around 1%, so basically what we see happening is, is Git um, competing for share both with Subversion and then with TFS and, and Source Safe over the next few years. Uh, it's, it also explains why uh, the Microsoft folks have embraced uh, uh, Git support in uh, Visual Studio and in uh, VS Online. Um, let's take a look at Build and CI tools. Little bit of a more complete picture here, uh, and this is a select all because we do see that teams tend to use multiple uh, tools in this space. Uh, but uh, once you discount the Visual Studio developers who by default tend to use TFS, uh, you see uh, Ant and Maven and Jenkins and Ivy and Hudson and Cruise Control and Gradle uh, all as, as leading options in this space. So I would say in the CI space, uh, open source is very much in the process of taking over and being the, uh, 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 the, the dominant way uh, that, uh, that CI is done. It could mean integrated with, but it's essentially stuff that they have cobbled together. Yeah, it's a little bit more complex now than it used to be. That used to be pretty clear that we wrote our own, you know, build and release management systems, and a lot of companies did that. We are seeing that a lot less uh, these days. Um, let's take a look at release management. Here, it's another area where we are starting to see open source uh, um, exerting more and more of a push. In particular, um, I'll point out Ansible. We didn't even see Ansible when we ran this survey last year, and when we ran it this year, uh, it's, it's now right up there uh, competing with Chef uh, for developers' mind share. Uh, but then you've also got CF Engine and Puppet and, uh, and Salt coming up. So this is another area where I expect uh, open source to pretty <coughs> much take over and push these other products into the substitution zone in the not too distant future. Um, it gets even better uh, when you start looking at mobile application development. So when we ask mobile developers in, in the 1700 developer survey, about 519 said that they had built a mobile app uh, in the last uh, 12 months. When we ask them what frameworks they are using, as you would expect, a lot of people say that they build native applications. Uh, but you know, beyond that, you've got jQuery and jQuery mobile uh, right up there at par. Uh, and then you've got Apache Cordova and PhoneGap uh, as one of the most frequently used uh, open source containers in this case uh, to build mobile applications. Uh, and then you've got the Accelerator Titanium framework and Dojo Mobile. There's a whole lot of other frameworks below that. I just took the top 10 uh, in terms of uh, the developer responses. A um, little bit suspicious of that Oracle number, but uh, um, uh, you know, it, it is what it is, you know, you don't, I think it's more people reporting that they use whatever Oracle tells them to use than ADF Mobile specifically. Um, now let's take one last step. When we look at web development and development in the HTML5 space, um, the top 10 frameworks are all open source in terms of developer response rates. Uh, jQuery, uh, pretty clearly uh, uh, used by, uh, by almost half of, of web developers. Uh, HTML5 uh, boilerplate bootstrap. Uh, I'll be surprised if we don't see significant growth in Angular between this year and next year, because it seems to be on everybody's uh, lips these days. Uh, but it's one of about a dozen and a half. And if I were to put the next 10 on this list, uh, you'd probably see that almost all of them were open source as well. Uh, so when the web world <laughs> You know, it's, it's not even a question of commercial products anymore. It just is open source, and that's the way that you build, uh, at least the way that our, the devs in our surveys uh, build their web applications. Okay, um, back to the future of open source survey. Uh, so we asked uh, 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 the software professionals in this survey uh, what uh, business problems you're trying to solve that you believe open source can address. Uh, they still do believe that, that open source can reduce uh, their cost and improve their efficiency. Uh, and it, uh, a lot of them believe that it can also improve their IT infrastructure. And of course, it's kind of a self-selecting audience because only 4% said that open source won't solve any of our business problems. Um, 
I'll pick on this one here because I think that folks are underestimating the effect that uh, open source can have on attracting and retaining a workforce. If I get back to that intrinsically motivated developer that likes to do code so much that they do it on their own time, um, giving those developers control of their own destiny is extremely important to, to giving them a feeling that uh, uh, they can, can make a difference. So I would say don't necessarily discount that even though it seems like the, the broad market of software professionals seems to. Right, right, right. The example I would use is if you think about an automobile, if the hood's welded shut, all you got to do is hire drivers, okay? If you can open up the hood, then you can hire drivers that are also mechanics, okay? And they can do their own work on the car instead of having to take it to the dealer. people will change. Yes. And, and organizations will change as well, because instead of having the support organization, which is completely different than the development organization, all of a sudden you start to see uh, dev and ops coming together. Uh, you see folks uh, essentially, the issue becomes, well, if there's a problem, why can't we fix it ourselves? Uh, American Express went through this when they uh, started using uh, Alfresco, uh, I believe a number of years ago, when they discovered they could actually make some of the modifications that they wanted their relationship with Alfresco became much more about, well, how do we take the changes that we've made and get that back into the core product so we don't have to maintain them as a separate fork over the long term instead of when are you going to give us this fix and, and which VP do we need to get on the line to threaten you, uh, you know, this, this today. So I'm almost out of time and I've just got a few more things here. Um, this is interesting to me. I hope it's true. Uh, with regard to corporate participation in open source communities in the next two to three years, do you expect your company to uh, contribute to more open source projects? Would be great. Now, again, remember half of the folks on here are vendors, so there a lot of them are already contributing. Uh, but uh, I am starting to get more questions from what I would consider IT shops about what's an effective open source contribution policy. So the fact that those questions are starting to come up uh, leads me to believe that they're starting to think beyond the lines of, well, if you're working for us, you can contribute uh, uh, patches under your own email address, but don't by any means put the company email address uh, on your, your contribution profile. Um, we're actually getting to the point where, especially in the financial services industry, a few banks are starting to look at their contributions to open source as part of marketing to the developer community uh, and are starting to see the value in that. So uh, it becomes part of outreach. So I used this slide earlier in my, my keynote and, and uh, just to kind of get back to it, um, the result of this behavior of more developers contributing to open source projects is leading to what I term the rise of the forge. Essentially I view a forge like GitHub as the developer's equivalent of Facebook. It is their home base. It is where they go. It is where they form connections with other developers that are intrinsically motivated. Now, in the open source survey, we ask a specific question about, um, about projects. And, and one of the, the trends, which we're not sure what to make of right now, which is the fact that a lot of these projects on GitHub have no license at all. They are post open source, if you will. Now, my personal feeling on this is I think it's because most developers aren't lawyers and they don't understand the importance of licensing more than just a total rejection of the idea of licensing. Uh, but I'm not sure what advice to give 
Um, the companies that I deal with, when it comes to using that code, other than I would steer clear of it as long as it does not have some sort of license uh, in the short term, uh, because you don't know what the, uh, uh, what the impact of that's going to be if it gets a license after the fact. Yep. Comment about that. So just yep. like two weeks ago, I was on GitHub, I found some project, and I'm like, oh, this looks cool, I want to use it for something. Yep. It had no license. Yep. So the response was very simple. I opened the stick, yep. and you don't have a license, it's yep. fine. And within a couple of hours, the guy replied, so what license do you think I should use? Did you say MIT? <laughs> <laughs> between, like, the Apache license yeah. and GPL or whatever. I'm like, I, I don't care as long as it's something that's certified, certified, and yep. well-known. Beautiful. Ask. That's yeah. great. It's a great idea. Yeah. 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 But it's an issue that uh, it's an issue that uh, is an emerging one that we need to think about. Yeah, it's something that I also think needs to be pushed back even further into the space. It's something that the university should be talking about. It's actually even something that might need to go earlier uh, than the universities. Uh,